I'm Harlan Emil Gruber, and welcome to Portal to the New Earth. Today, I'm really excited and honored to have Mitchell Joachim. He's a professor of architecture at NYU and the co-founder of Terraform One Studios, which is his architectural and art studio that works on developing various projects, such as the ones I included in my book, The Fab Tree Hab, and what you can see behind me, his vision of the post-carbon city-state. This is a view down one of the avenues in New York City that's been transformed into this beautifully lush green environment with a stream flowing down the middle, uh, easy access to public transportation, drones flying to take care of the trees. And it's just an incredible vision that he has for how we can live uh, in harmony with the earth. So I'm really excited to dive into these projects and all the other stuff that Mitchell has to share with us today. I'm super glad to finally getting a chance to get uh, into this conversation with you and to have this discussion. It's been a few years since the last time we talked, and I, I'm really looking forward to just getting uh, into the weeds and getting into details about all the things we want to talk about. So uh, happy that you set this up and that you sent a ping and wanted to make, uh, you know, make this conversation and dialogue uh, reach fruition. So I am I'm glad to, I would say, be here, but we're, we're in two different places, but uh, together on the Internet, I guess. So, yeah, so thank you all, for having me. So, yeah, this I'm, is great. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because, you, of course, you're in your studio in Brooklyn and down in the uh, Navy Yard. And I can see, though, right behind you along the windows, look at all those beautiful plants just growing so happily and bringing some nature into your environment. So I'll start off by saying how we met, which was, uh, I can't remember exactly how I learned about you, but you were, you're a notable figure. You know, your work has been featured in Time Magazine years ago and other places. So through learning about what you were doing way back back in 2008, I was invited to, or I submitted and was accepted to present on this concept I've been developing, which of course is also featured in my book, this uh, arcology project, the 12 Spiral City. So I reached out to you to see if there was some form or way of collaborating to add to this presentation that I did at this uh, EcoCity Summit in San Francisco in uh, 2008. So we actually, I came over and met with you in the office and we discussed this. And of course, you know, you're running a, both a, a, a major design studio and a teacher at this at you know NYU at the, and so you know you didn't really have much time to dive into it but it was a really great uh introduction of us getting to meet each other and getting to know each other a little and that was many years ago so now here we are you know coming around full circle to continue our conversation in our shared visions of creating these you know beautifully uh ecologically integrated environments so you know i would love uh, my first question for you today would be you know just kind of your whole background how you got into it how you were inspired and you know and what brought about you know you going down this avenue of creating these projects that i featured in the book and other projects of similar you know inspiration yeah, I, I remember that conversation and and thoughts about arcology, which a lot of that was influenced by Paolo Soleri and and Richard Register and and Eco Cities was a was a big thing, still is a big thing, although its meaning has transformed over the years. So that's that's good to know. Uh, you know, um, I got into the, the work that I'm doing. I you know I don't know. I guess I've always wanted to do this since I was five. I was drawing buildings and years and years of just wanting to be an architect. Started working as an architect at the age of 14 for Carl Hess in uh, New City, New York. And then, um, you know, going to school for it, went every place to get multiple degrees in urban design and architecture. Uh, then eventually a PhD in computation, uh, you know, and then, then, then starting this uh, this practice, which is a nonprofit. So you know, Terraform One, we're we're a five hundred one c three think tank that has one overriding predicate, and our our kind of mission is to design against extinction, and that's that's the goal, and and that that's something that's more than about you know sustainability. It's more than about environmental engineering. It's, it's really getting to the core of the problem, which is even bigger than climate change, which is increasing biodiversity and doing that through infrastructure, through the built environment, through communities of all different kinds and thinking 
at large what those strategies are so that we uh, don't start killing off everything on this planet. I mean, we're looking at you know every nine minutes or so, depending on how you do the numbers, another species dies forever on this planet. And that's just unacceptable. And that's because of the activities you and I do every single day. Uh, whether it's turning on the ignition of our car, using a little bit of gas, creating a little bit of carbon, we don't think that's wiping out an entire species, but it is because at 9 a.m. there's 400 million people turning on those car key, turning the car keys, and those you know that ignition goes on. And so, you know, we, we don't want to change people's behavior. We're not trying to do that. We're just trying to think of ways that we can use the power of design, which is the most powerful tool humans have. It's our imagination turned into uh, objects and things that we use, and and use that methodology transform it, turn it upside down into a logic that makes sense for the Earth's metabolism. And that means using biomaterials or biotech. It means designing with cells. It means using uh, what we call engineered living materials, such as woody plants or trees, and shape them or nudge them into usable structures. It's a whole host of different ideas. But, uh, you know, our practice is centered around that. It's centered around actually giving a voice to things that don't have a voice. So our clients are crickets, monarch butterflies, uh, E. coli, mycelium or mushroom or reishi. We, we just have a whole host of different living organisms that we, we, we sort of jam with or tune together our relationship to those organisms trying the best we can to imagine a better place for both of us because we're not you know if there's a race where one of us has to go i don't want to you know say humans need to leave even though that looks like the problem probably is the problem so it's finding that symbiosis between those organisms that don't necessarily talk but are dying off and humans which are going to reach something like 11 billion people by the end of the century depending on where COVID goes so, so Terraform is working to do that, and we're, we're a team. So, so it's even though I, you know I actually did that drawing behind you, that the ideas and the thought processes and the methodology was over four hundred different researchers working for a very long time. Uh, for the last sixteen years, we've been around, coming up with all different ideas and visions and methods for how we can get to what we call a socio-ecological city. A city that recognizes that we need to fit into the Earth's metabolism, but also that the public is capricious, that we change our mind all the time, and we need to onboard them in that process. It's it's Maybe it's not so obvious, I, I don't know, but it, it design needs to be holistic, top-down, bottom-up, simultaneously, and those visions help people create uh, an idea of what that green city would be and argue for or against it. So we can use those little arguments to get to a, a version of that city that's a, that, that works for more of us, not just for one single visionary. I don't subscribe to that and I don't think I ever will uh, because you know, even behind someone like Paolo Soleri is Frank Lloyd Wright and an army of other people that help produce the work that he's doing, including, you know, the, the Arizona project, the uh, Arcasanti. So, uh, all right. So that's my little intro speech. I don't know what you're no, thinking. It's great. It, it made me think of, you know, what got me started on this path was coming across Buckminster Fuller's book, uh, Synergetics. And what you were saying, what Terraform One is about, is about you know, he, there's a famous quote of his, which is, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Terraform One is clearly working on making those new models. And, you know, right now, the models that we have are destructive to the earth, as we know, they, and they've been implemented, and we all use them, you know, all the time, the way that we inhabit the earth in a detrimental way. And so, we need to be now, and, and, and instead of fighting that, saying, no, no, don't do that. That's not the answer. The answer is to build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And that seems to be the focus of Terraform One is working on developing these new models that will make it so that we can live in harmony with all of life and not just for humans. Yeah, uh, Bucky is a superhero. 
You know, it's um, it's interesting because he stands out above and beyond pretty much most architects from the previous century. He's not really an architect. He's a event inventor, free thinker, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, hacker slash engineer. He's a real what we call polymath or heterodoxic thinker. He just disciplines and knowledge sets would flow through him and he was a bit loony you know he would give these lectures that would go on for hours uh and he just his writings are incredible but also prolific to the point of you know overdoing it it's not, uh, not, but a lot of useful not, yeah. not accessible which is unfortunate in his, his books and writings is aren't exactly you know user friendly you really have to dive in and yeah. want to read and deal with his way of, of of writing and his language but fortunately you know he is yeah still, but better than not having any writings you know yeah, no yeah. and of course he's still you know being very notable right now you know i was in this buckminster fuller institute design science studio which is on pause right now but they were doing they're trying to do the whole uh 2020 to 2030 every year a uh program um and you know, yeah, he is still a major influence, and maybe even when I say major influence, actually, he's not. He's a minor influence, but he's starting to take on more influence even at this time, even though he passed, you know, fifty years ago. And um, he's a major influence. Even I was looking at this uh, old uh, video of Steve Jobs talking about relaunching the Apple campaign, and how he just didn't. He wanted to have a advertising campaign that did not mention computers and didn't sell computers in fact it made no mention that these would be devices that help you uh you know do work better manage things better uh do redundant tasks incredibly simply and that the interface would be for almost anyone to access and to transform education he didn't want to say anything all he wanted to do is point out values and you know I have some issues with Steve Jobs, but this particular one, the campaign that he started for Apple was brilliant because he wanted to align the values of that company. And values are probably the most important thing you have. It's your principles with a set no, group of people that were transformative. And he mentioned Buckminster Fuller. That was the opening to the Apple campaign with John Lennon, with Gandhi, with Martin Luther King with Albert Einstein, you know, with uh, Rachel Carson, that was the think different or the, you know, the think different campaign. And they, and these people were doing just that. It had nothing to do with computers whatsoever. And they, they really didn't mention any other architect. I think Frank Lloyd Wright came in there a little bit later, but more people resonate with Bucky than they do with the typical architect. And I, you know, I, I guess I, you know, I don't have a problem with, architects i just I'm, i have way more in common with with buckminster fuller than i ever would with with um i don't know other architects frank lloyd wright who's you know great in his own right it just i think those yeah. those moments happened and i think they, these kinds of thinkers that want to do something that's um you know difficult and and work on wicked problems which take five seven 15 years to solve uh, that's 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 a that's a different type of beast. It's a different kind of nature of of uh, of both scientific and artistic uh, commitment to get something like that um, undone. And it, and it may you're always at the risk of failing or not quite solving it. And uh, great. And most of the things that Buckminster Fuller and many of those other people they just didn't fully achieve in their lifetimes. Uh, and maybe that's why why they're more significant. Although, I don't know, they shouldn't be necessarily remembered as those individuals. It's the things that they produced that's probably the more important thing, like civil disobedience, Henry David Thoreau, like uh, who you don't have to know Thoreau to know that you could argue against the government or the state or whatever in power is in place and do it peacefully. And that's a Thoreauvian concept, which is what Gandhi had used to, you know, fight the British Empire uh, or Martin Luther King to create civil rights. So so I, I don't have to know Martin Luther King to know that civil rights is very important. 
So I, and I guess privileging the, the methods and the meanings and the, and those values are more important than maybe the individuals behind them. So probably the Steve Jobs issue is that he had such a excellent and overly healthy ego that he had to attribute these things to individuals when really it's the the millions of people behind them that resonated with it that made those things uh, a reality. Yeah. I remember, I think the ads were just a picture of them and it just said, think different. And it yes. had the Apple logo and that was it. And, you know, you listed a number of the people that were featured in it and most of them were, everyone knows who they are. But the last name you mentioned was Rachel Carson. And I know who that is only because, you know, I went to uh, my first university I went to, I didn't finish, was Emory University in the mid 70s, right? I just turned 64. I got out of high school a year early and I went off to Emory. And as part of going to Emory, they had this prerequisite. I don't know why, but you had to read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Now, mind you, in the mid 70s, the Environmental Protection Agency was just coming into full effect. Throughout the entire 60s, there was hardly any- Thank you, thank you, Nixon, protection. by the way. What? Just little credit to Nixon for that one. If we okay. did anything good. But, but yeah. first of all, like the New York City was, which is what, you know, I grew up outside of New York, but New York City, the Hudson River, it was dead. The skies were filled with smoke. The garbage was everywhere. There was literally no pro environmental protection. Even I grew up on Long Island. The Great South Bay had a metallic sheen to it because companies that did plating would release their uh, you know, waste right into the water. And it was killing all the clams and detoxifying the environment to such a degree that finally, and also I remember I grew up on this river. There was uh, soap suds floating down the river because they had those phosphates in detergent. And finally in the 70s it got so bad that they're like okay we got to regulate this or we're going to kill the planet and that's what silent spring was about actually the main focus of silent spring rachel carson's you know notable book in the 70s was the ddt problem we were using ddt on everything and that was killing all the food the entire food chain it was insane and so you know we only just started to become conscious of this in our lifetime, our generation, you know, we're we're somewhat close. I'm a little older than you, but we 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 lived through it. But a lot of people right now who will be watching this are from a generation where they didn't live through that, and maybe don't even know that that's what exactly happened, and that we uh, really do have to be conscious of how humans interact with the environment, or we're going to destroy it. And the thing is, you know, right now there's a thing coming up. You know, they use Roundup on every single wheat field in America. And it's a, it's toxic. And, you know, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but there is the possibility that some of this stuff is by design, that they are allowing detrimental things into the human population. Um, that's a tangent. Let's keep this on track. Yeah, 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 no. I mean, everything you said about Rachel Carson, absolutely true. Also, I believe they mentioned Jane Goodall, and uh, Mary Curie and just a whole host of other like overachieving, brilliant women. So, which I, I think is important to recognize, uh, you know, Rachel Carson is the sort of mother of the environmental movement in a lot of ways. Um, I, I actually also think that John Hershey or Hershey's um, Hiroshima book, which predates, predates that was even stronger when it comes to us thinking about the environment was the, the first time really the first time in the in the modern era where we understood that humans have the capacity to wipe out all of nature to end everything which bill mckibben picks up on many many years later i guess in the, sure. the 90s but Ra rachel carson and ddt is just this story has gone on forever i was actually looking at other variants of it like uh screaming winter instead of silent spring and what those things mean because you know her message still crystal clear to this day hasn't necessarily gotten as far as we need to uh and that's why you have greta dernberg who is just this kid different than your generation or my generation who's just saying you know what it's all bullshit i, I think her famous speech the blah 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 at you know uh, uh was it in davos someplace in a world economic forum where she said all these political leaders, all the old folks, or basically anyone over the age of 25, uh, you've, you've been screwing up forever and I don't believe you anymore. And now I have no planet to inherit. 
And uh, boy, is she right. So, you know, even probably more prominent would be someone like her. And she just seems to be raging. Uh, you know, I mean, the, and there's a massive uh, force of intelligence behind her that's supporting her messaging. And, and I, I guess it's working. But, you know, we're still stuck in this problem that you and I have lived with our entire lives. It's like a known quantity, a known fact of damage to the environment. And, and very little has been done. And I, I'm not a cons conspiracy theorist, I guess. That's what someone says before they break into a conspiracy. But, uh, but I, I would say that for the longest time, we have been fighting something called predatory delay. And predatory delay, uh, Alex Stefan had first coined that term. But what that really means is that the, 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 the businesses that we're up against, we meaning uh, environmental activists or people that want to do something good for the planet, they're making enormous profits to the you know, billions uh, a day, and that's the fossil fuel industry. And and this is where, um, you know, they will agree with your concepts. They'll agree with an art project. They'll agree with a, a new battery technology. They will support some kind of wind turbine initiative. And they'll say as a PR campaign, these are good things and the earth needs these things, but let's not do it right now. Here's a little bit of money. Let's just delay it because every single day we are in business, we make enormous profits and people don't want instant or radical change. I mean, that's what they're claiming. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, when Pearl Harbor happened uh, with the United States in less than two years, first of all, in a few days, Congress stopped bickering. We we're now in a war. We had a common enemy and we were going to retool the entire infrastructure to make tanks and planes and fight our enemy. And that was it. And it, di it didn't take long. Same with the Rural Electrification Act uh, in the early 1900s. Everyone in the United States got electricity. Everyone. The most remote farmer had a right to electricity. So we could transform our economy in a year or two without even blinking, probably even faster. Just predatory delay is the thing that slows it down. It makes us question. It makes us a little lethargic. It gives us other things to distract us. It's a it's a it's a curious little animal. It's really hard to fight because they're they're not saying they want to fight you up front. It's a behind the scenes series of machinations and and movements that slow down progress that's at the level of you know transformation we need to respect biodiversity to respect climate change and to retool our economy out of fossil fuels you know the term predatory delay i never wait i said it wrong predatory, predatory delay yeah yeah oh, it is so yeah, it's, it, yeah. You, i never heard it before but once you put it into words like that then you kind of see it it's like kind of seeing something that they don't want you to see but you brought up another interesting thing about, you know, with Pearl Harbor and how we put so much into the, the military. And even now today, the military budget is just insane. The amount that is spent by the United States, which is more than like the other three superpowers in the world put together. And this brings us back to Buckminster Fuller, you know, quote or saying about how we just need to shift from weaponry to livingry. Like, if, could you imagine if instead you, if we just took the entire budget of our military and put it towards making environmental friendly everything from transportations to homes and everything, what could be done? But no. But, but us okay, but okay, yes, yes, mostly. Like our, our military does trickle down, like not all of it, but you know, um, Probably some of the biggest advances in computation, quantum computing is a military effort that's going to change everyone's lives and has. Uh, is spending money on a you know $60 million F-22 to shoot down a Chinese balloon, that's not money well spent. But yeah, there, there are things that the, only the military industrial complex could probably achieve. It's a matter of when it's released and getting access to that. And it's a very careful thing to do. It's a slippery slope because as soon as the the average capitalist or business person in a democracy gets access to this, the market takes over. And then those things work for a little bit, whatever technology is trickling in from the military. But then it's 
it's reverse engineered and goes to places like China and all of that money and effort in the things that we invented and developed suddenly permeates to every other culture, which I'm okay with, but the people who invent it and make it, and maybe the average tax paying American is not so happy that the Chinese benefit from our trillion dollars worth of research in the military. And we don't get a chance to use it for more than one or two years before they capture it. Uh, so, and that's, that's one of a, a million issues, but those technologies, even the space program, we had, we we're talking earlier about that. They do, they do come into infrastructure in the built environment and into the workplace and into our homes. They do it through strange routes introduced through shell companies or maybe directly attributed to the inventors, but it, it is there. Um, it's just that so much of it seems to be this black box and we start to get conspiratorial about what's really happening there. Uh, and that's fair because it's just such an enormous amount of uh, our money that we don't know where it's going. Uh, but it, but it does eventually show up, um, you know, chat GPT, not so much, but a lot of that was military backed, uh, not, not open AI itself, but before it arrived at that level of computing, that was military based uh, you know, the AI that we're seeing now with diffusion models also like this was developed for the military. The military has even approached us to think about new forms of camouflage using engineered living materials to camouflage radar and electronic arrays and even components to, you know, hide, uh, uh, you know, powertrains for tanks or jeeps or or drones and hide them in actual physical living plants and other materials which would make it virtually invisible to enemy radar. Not my thing, but, you know, if they, uh, we've been doing it on our own for 15 years, if the Pentagon can get it right, and then it benefits all of us where we make homes from from living plants, I, you know, I'll take one for the team. Right. And, so, you know, so, so, so it is, a, it is a, like at MIT, we were there, it was, it was really hard because half the research was funded by the military. Half those folks become astronauts or go to NASA. Or not half the folks become astronauts, but many astronauts went to MIT. The, but many of the people that were at MIT work in defense. And I, I just had a real problem saying, well, why are you spending all of your mental energy developing smart bombs for dumb leaders, which was a slogan then. But, it, you know, it, it that those same same technologies eventually cross over and transform paths and can be used for good. So it's just, you know, the only one out there funding it is something like DARPA or the Pentagon. I mean, it, we have to think about like the private investors don't necessarily jump into, you know, uh, procurious areas of research and are not really sure when they're going to get a return on their investment. The military will do that for a certain amount of time not that i am and i got to be clear saying the military is the route to go it's just there is some success stories from there and uh, yeah. i recognize well, obviously, obviously that is the route that we're in right now and of course the trickle down though takes a long time before yeah. it does reach us and if we could somehow like buckminster fuller would envision shift our focus from weaponry to livingry so let's uh bring this back uh on focus because uh you did mention about this idea of like building a house by growing it and that's one of your more notable projects that i included the fab tree hab which uh you know what uh We'll put the link to your TED talk, so you don't have to go into you know all the details about it here. Someone can uh, just go and watch that whole explanation of it. But just this whole thinking of uh, livingry of how we build our homes, and like Buckminster Fuller did say that in the building industry, there's like a 50 year delay between innovation and when it's finally implemented because there's such a the, that predatory delay that the industry that's entrenched doesn't want these new things. And, you know, even when he came out with the Dymaxion house, it got completely crushed. It was like a house based on like aircraft manufacturing techniques to make a super light, super amazing house that could be transported and put anywhere. And ar the architectural and building construction industry said, no, you're not doing that. We got to build the houses the way we've been building it. And even now someone just sent me some, uh, 
house that unfolds and is all like that, you know, and of course, tiny homes and all this stuff, but it's really been kind of kept to a minimum what we could actually build as far as living re goes because of the entrenched industries that you know rule and like i i live out here you know i'm in california and i drive through i went into la and back to pick up my books and you see that suburban sprawl the same box houses built out of the same crappy materials from home depot you know osb and tyvek wrapped and they just make you know it's not the eco village that i want to go and move and live into and yet that's still is the MO. That's still how we're developing the United States. You put a strip mall with your supermarket and your Walmart and your Home Depot and your Starbucks, and they're the same everywhere, whether you're in Connecticut or California or any state in between, and you build these box houses that just sprawl forever. So let, now let's, you know, so you, you, you could describe, I love your description, you know, and like I said, you don't have to go into detail, but, you know, the Fab Tree Hub is definitely a departure from that way of thinking and you're setting up it's like a model of how to think of how we can build and i know you have other ideas besides that of the same so <laughs> yeah i can't believe you mentioned home depot but uh and there's lowe's and of course ob the german versions and bauhaus and uh you know this, uh, i mean you know these are also trillion dollar industries and probably if you expand it, it's the entire global economy. I mean, every major country in the world is contributing different parts and materials and labor to the things that we purchase in these massive big box retail uh, outlets. And, and you know, the, the average person or even a typical developer or anyone who wants a family home or anyone that's a bank manager or in charge of a mortgage loan all of these things are highly, highly connected. Not only are they connected, they're married. They're, they are family. And you it's very hard to undo any one point of that chain from insurance to real estate to your neighbors, like regular people. And, building and then you, codes you, and government involvement in it. Policy, architecture, yes, planners. And then you, you drop in a, a house made from aircraft materials. I, I mean, I absolutely applaud that. We need a society that at least welcomes the those inventions. The the transformation that we would all be living in these, you know, Dymaxian homes overnight, it, it seems to be insane. Not that what was done isn't brilliant. I guess there's there, you know, there's a fine line between insanity and brilliance, but it's just the the to to achieve that, even to change your lawn in the United States, well, is is a very difficult thing to do. People are in a community; they have their values are entrenched in many cases. They are not thinking about future homes; they're thinking about sports, thinking about Christmas or Hanukkah. They're thinking about uh, you know the economy. They're thinking about the war in Ukraine. They're not thinking about future homes necessarily and you know if it does come about it has to be such a convincing massive leapfrogging technology that is cheaper and better and instantaneous and is just obvious it's so cogent and so crystal clear like a diamond bullet going through the center of your skull that you have to go with that that idea as opposed to the home depot system it's very tough to get there. Um, you know, we think we might have a version of that, but we, we we don't have the hubris to believe it's going to happen overnight because of all of the mechanisms in this marriage, this chain of, of connection that, that people need. Even when I want to get materials for a home, like, a, you know, renovating a place uh, upstate, it's just all the math comes down to actually Home Depot, uh, you know, as the typical answer or the contractors we're using. It's a toilet. I I, I have a lot, limited time on this earth to redesign toilets. You know, they're, they're 300 bucks. Uh, it's crazy. It's not really 300 bucks. Story of Stuff, Annie Leonard, 
that uh, that video and her book, and she's the CEO of Greenpeace, she'll tell you that toilet really isn't three hundred dollars. Can't be possibly really made for that, but it's there. Uh, aisles and rows of them in our our giant retail outlets, and they plug into an infrastructural system and a utility network that is very hard to change, including the regulations and the rules and the laws about polluting this environment. And and there isn't, you know, we're not going to necessarily, you know, go to outboxes overnight uh, or outhouses, sorry. Although we probably should, we probably should, but I just don't see the, you know, red-blooded everyday American deciding to throw out all of this convenience that's been worked on since ancient Rome or ancient China and, and do something that is a, a kind of a radical uh, indigenous infrastructural technique for going to the bathroom. Um, so, so we're working hard to propose changes that on some level impact people softly. There's just very little, very little ask to change, but the benefit is dramatic. That's key. Tesla is one of the few examples where sustainability was achieved with that way. It's a soft amount of transformation. You got to get off gas and maybe now have a latte as you're charging your car. Still difficult for many people to, to cross that line. Still very difficult, but it's an electric vehicle. And then we can work on the rare earth metals, the cobalt and the lithium ion, all the things associated with problems with electric cars. But it, it it sold people uh, this idea of, of a new type of vehicle system and powertrain that we needed to get to when Ford and Toyota and Nissan, every other company couldn't do. I mean, the Prius was a joke. Uh, Mark Wahlberg destroyed that entire car through half of, by, sorry, from the perspective of half the men in America by getting in it and saying it's like driving a giant vagina. I don't, you know, that guy crushed the sales. Uh, and then along comes Elon Musk and sells a muscle car, a luxurious, you know, powerful vehicle that says I'm a, you know, a powerful man or I, I own precious things. And it worked with our system. I Look, I, I can't change how, you know, what people value. I just, I do recognize that those values are real and uh, they're, 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 they're not that deep. So, you know, the Home Depot isn't that deep. That's probably why it works. Uh, and if we're going to offer a new technology that's going to change things, it has to not, honestly, on the surface, not be that deep. It's got to be so clear that Homer Simpson gets it uh, and, and that uh, he immediately subscribes to it, not because it's good for the environment, because Tesla didn't use that, by the way, either. They didn't, they, it was a sideline project. They didn't advertise. It just sort of was, it's a hot, new, fast car. Uh, but something that just makes sense, that's cheaper than existing models, cheaper than Home Depot, and happens to be fantastic, gives you more space, gives you more room. And, and just somewhere mentioning, you know what, it's good for animals and insects and trees and birds and nature. But not really the upfront because most people don't care. They they actually want to have a, a home that's good for their family. And so we are trying to make a home that's multi-species, multi-species for all the different organisms we share this planet with, but also for human communities and human activities, our jobs, our schools, our government. Like that, it is a it, it is a um, it's a tough project, and the the messaging that that. Uh, you know, that Buckminster Fuller has for all of his amazing invention and his, you know, his real glorification of this change. Uh, you know, he creates for every co convert he has, he creates an enemy, creates people that feel outside of that loop, that feel like they're not as special, that feel like they don't deserve something like that. They're not in the elite class that deserves a, you know, a superstar house. They want to just be like everyone else. Uh, you know, maybe they'll have a cool car. You know, but it, but so so it's it's getting the everyday person on board.
that is really tough. And I don't even know what that means. I just know that that's a part of the problem and, and to respect those folks. I, I don't subscribe to some of their views. Uh, I, you know, nothing against, well, I don't understand what happened with America and Trump, but it's this new world. And the idea that 51% of Americans support him or maybe more is mind boggling to me, but that only means I better pay attention and understand what their values are. Because if I just get more left and more extreme and more, you know, promissory about new technology is going to change everything, the further away they're going to go from our message, the more right they're going to be on the, the right side of the equation, the more entrenched they will be into traditional values and traditional looking homes and traditional infrastructure and mowing that lawn using roundup for the weeds um and and you know and all the water possible just to keep grass happy when we don't need grass we need biodiverse environments now, okay so i was on a little bit of a soapbox but i'm helping with you to sort of to frame the problem that buckminster fuller really didn't do a good job of he i mean he did a good job in the time to 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 be heroic but it's not heroes we need we need people that fit into the scales of economy that work within the realm of buildability that fit into those systems so that the change that happens makes sense for billions not for you know a hundred thousand people that know the difference here and there so and i so it's that hero versus like the the everyday that uh, that that I str that we struggle with. If that makes sense, I don't know. I don't know what you think of all that. It was, that's, that's where I'm at. It, it was definitely a very illuminating tangent, you know. I, but I was, and I'm going to bring it back. I don't even know how to comment. It was a great information you shared. You said that. Home Depot. You I did say brain. that, but, but, it, but it was in response to, and like I said, the video on the Fab Tree app, and I love that project because it's just so completely out there idea, which is just essentially, instead of trees grow, cut them down, cut them up into pieces, bring them someplace and put them back together into a house, the idea is grow the tree directly into a house. It sounds unbelievable, but if you put your mind to anything, anything's possible. And like, you know, we met because of my idea for this 12 spiral city megastructure, which in my mind is just the structure of the city. It would be infilled with, you know, beautiful homes that anyone could build any organic, beautiful way, such as a fab tree hab. Why not just plant and grow a house like that. And that it, it does tie into, you know, I was influenced by William Catavalis, who had the idea of organic architecture, that architecture can be grown in, maybe in other ways than using trees to grow it. So I'm just going to put that out there as part of you know this yeah. conversation we're having because yep. it's such a visionary making a new model for how we approach society, not fighting the existing system of Home Depots and building codes and all that. You know, we don't have to fight or uh, fix it even. All we need to do is think of the new model and more and more people are kind of waking up. And if we can just put these new models into place, those old models will become obsolete. Eventually, uh, eventually. Maybe but... hopefully sooner than, than we think. You know, it's like, why not just change the channel on your TV? We've been well, watching it, it, this one I, channel I, and just freaking click change new model. That's Look, my I get, I get it, but but let, okay. So I want to talk about paper companies, and I want to talk about biomass, and and what what this could mean as far as large scale, like uh, giga scale transformation. At the same time, I, let's recognize that there are millions, just millions of Americans that have jobs in real estate, in carpentry, in construction bricklayers, unions, welders, uh, you know, even a Virginia coal miner realizes the stuff poisoned my grandfather. Well, every single one of us is going to eventually get cancer. It's absolutely a fact from this activity, but this is our culture. This is our homes. These are our communities and they vote in a certain way and very hard to change that. It's a mentality to say that they're going to get into the solar panel business. Maybe a few of them 
will jump ship and they'll do it. But the, the others are just, they don't know any different. And it, and it, it's, it's just not necessarily that easy to transform masses of people into something else. A, a, a carpenter is a great job in the United States. It's, suddenly now they're, they're becoming arbor smiths and they need to understand tree species and growth. Like I, I know the ask and, and it's, it's, it's something that won't necessarily happen at scale or needs to be thought of to in, be very inclusive, inclusive of all of those trades, all of those communities and all of those traditions. Uh, and I've, I've learned that over the years as a, uh, you know, as a, a fellow American that they're just not wrong. They have a different viewpoint and um, you know, it's very hard to, to uh, switch your entire career and learn new things, uh, especially things that seem just astronomically different. So on that note, uh, the Home Depot alternative is something like we've been looking at, where can you possibly get the amount of resources you would need to grow homes? To use engineered living materials from different woody plant species over, you know, to graft trees together to form inosculate, uh, continuous vascular systems made of living organisms. Like, it, all right, that doesn't mean much to many people, but it means you can grow trees together by nudging them together. They, they, it happens all the time in nature, especially in the tropics. You just need to nudge them into a usable shape for human programmatic use. So how do you do that at scale and how do you grow something quick enough and in be inclusive of many different professions and offer alternatives for people to continuously make money in the capitalist system that we have today? So we looked at a couple of avenues. One is farming. So there, there are initiatives, mostly in, in Germany, Switzerland, other parts of Europe, uh, where biomass production, growing trees to burn. These trees are grown... Uh, various woody plants such as willows are grown for a few years, five, seven years, and then they're harvested, pelletized, and then used as an alternate form of fuel. Brazil's got a different method uh, with sugar cane, but, but it, you are growing for fuel. And that is, that's a gargantuan industry. That's a lot of jobs. That's a lot of communities. And that's still really logical. So we want to take that same system that's already in place, keep making biomass fuel, but also take a portion of that and make homes. So if you're going to grow woody plants and you're going to grow them on a farm, millions of them in thousands of acres can actually pick up those plants and move them locally within a hundred miles and start growing a village of homes that because the plants are already pre-grown, you provide a scaffolding and you bend them into shape, you graft them and you're good to go on day one. And the scaffolding is good because it still includes a little bit of the Home Depot culture, a little bit of the advanced computational fabrication, elitist engineering people. And a lot of the carpenters are still there and, and other jobs, foundation elements and other things still need to happen. But you're providing a scaffold and then you're growing. So it's, a, it's a, a bridge system to a radical new technology where eventually you get a fully living home but you're respecting the trades and the system that's in place in the meantime, including rules and regulations about how we live in communities and how communities are designed. So, so, so we are looking at biomass or a grand agricultural economy into a grand housing economy. So that's m very similar to what we were describing in that Ted talk some time ago that I was describing, but now we're being much more exact as far as getting those trees to a place on time and working on day one. And then paper companies eventually become, these are people that you know also grow massive tree farms. And this is just for knocking them down and turning them into paper pulp and using different acids and ammonias and, and bleaches to you know give us stuff to write on. They also could become part of this new industry of construction when they start thinking of growing trees for producing homes uh, similar to energy farms. So, so those are two very big sectors that represent trillions of dollars of, of industry that are now offering new avenues for potential revenue. And, that, and that's, and still keeping a lot of jobs in line. It's not a perfect plan. And I'm only, 
you know, this is a sketch of a larger strategy. It has been 15 years for us to get to the point where we are growing a home in a site upstate New York near Storm King uh, so that people can see a home made out of living trees that is available on day one that connects all of these other uh, scales of economy and revenue streams and job, you know, tradesmen and jobs, hopefully without where the impact is only net positive as much as possible. And we got to, we got to be very real about the criticisms we'll get. Like, will this destroy some part of the economy or, or change how we look at homes and, and yes, it will, but will that be detrimental? Will will that, will that, be, will that have negative effects on, on, uh, on people? And we have to be very careful about that. And I, maybe we won't get the full answer right now because we know we can grow the structures, but it's it's very hard to grow, you know, to to grow doors and windows and uh, toilets and you know toasters and kitchen appliances. So there's so much that's conventional that goes into it anyway. And I and I'm and I don't know how to grow a TV. I know that there's organic LEDs, but they're not really organic, are they? And uh, you know, so so we're doing our job, which is to get to the big part, which is the framing systems and the structural systems, and maybe the foundational systems, uh, where we can we can grow those elements and use technologies that are out there. We have large scale three D clay printing. We think that printing earth is the least amount of carbon you can use next to growing plants, which is a positive sum game. Uh, that's that's also helpful, but has its limitations and getting those materials such as like a hemp crete, it's not necessarily readily available. It, it's taken 40 years to get hemp into the architectural guidelines as a legitimate material that you could build with. Like it's now part of building code. And that just happened this year. I could have told you that 20 years ago, hemp is great. Still and then even now that it's in building code, it doesn't mean that we actually can get it to, you know, it's just not available yet. Or mycelium as a great insulation system. Ecovative is an amazing company. Uh, they're manufacturing it uh, at bulk, if not at scale uh, levels. But, you know, I've looked down the, the Home Depot aisles of insulation and uh, fiberglass is still raging. And has a higher R value, and I you can buy it now, and it'll work for forty years, and it's guaranteed, it's insured, and put in by bonded contractors, and we all know that it just works and saves on your energy bills. So the idea we're going to get mushroom insulation today has just been very difficult to create that change, even though I'm one hundred percent for mycelium insulation and not fiberglass so uh you know and that's just changing one part of the house yeah. so i think more and more of these synergistic like and they we're going to use a bucky term uh like uh methods and things that go from ideas to being productized such as mushroom insulation or tree structures for a home like these these things eventually reach fruition and they snap together out of this primordial soup of different ideas that are out there and then eventually reach a point where they, they have a, a kind of a, a logic where they fit together. I don't think it's going to happen that soon. It would only happen if suddenly there's a massive climate crisis and we have to do this. But as long as like, you know, we're at business as usual and climate change is virtually invisible to many of us, especially biodiversity loss, I don't, I, I'm very skeptical about Americans changing things. And we have, there's other, you know, Bjorn Lumberg. Um, I'm on another sidetrack, but the skeptical environmentalist makes many arguments to me a little repulsive, but to others kind of makes sense. It will cost trillions of dollars to fix the temperature rise, but we can spend a fraction of that and help, help feed people, help the poor. I mean, it's, it's a crazy equation that he's making, but it, it's like it pulls on heartstrings and it fights against science. And a lot of us go with our hearts. Let's let's help some poor people. 
And, you know, what do those scientists really know about, you know, ocean acidity levels or, you know, polar ice, ice caps melting? I don't live there and polar bears aren't, uh, you know, they're not on TV much. The starving kids are. Um, I don't know if that helps, but but uh, th that's the the kind of the 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 horrible math that we have to do. Yeah, we really are up against you know an entrenched system. That's awesome to hear that that this fab tree hub is actually starting to be realized in some ways or not, you know and like of course we can't grow everything. But that's super cool that that's moving ahead. So then, of course, I want to touch on, which we could see right behind me, you know, and that you did this quite a long time ago, that your post-carbon city-state, where we take what we've already built and start to then add and retrofit to it. And on that note, I just, you know, in the previous uh, interview I did with James Wines, one of the projects I featured was their uh, Seville uh, Expo, where they built this amazing uh, a river and uh, a greenery down the middle of it for everyone to participate in. And what they did, though, was very similar in your Fab Tree Hub. They actually had to start two years before growing the various plants that were going to be used in this design. And when they finally built it, they had these mature plants that they were then integrated into this incredible arbor. And like he explained that, you know, Seville can be very hot in the summer, but you go into this space and it's 20 degrees cooler because they have this. And of course, you know, it's an expo, which is actually a great place, you know, it, for experimental things to be implemented before they become part of our everyday life. Uh, and so that's kind of like what's going on here, though, where we're taking yeah. a very harsh environment and turning it into a much more beautiful and like i say there's the beautiful wetlands and stream right down the middle and then the buildings are covered in greenery and so i know you you could talk a little bit about this but then i'm sure you have been thinking about ideas like this you know since then and trying to implement these concepts yeah yeah the, i mean that that's um Thank you for all that. And James Wines is is absolutely amazing. His High Rise of Homes project is one of my favorite of all time. Uh, you know, he is uh, one of the original thinkers and kind of one of the the pillars of the green movement, uh, which now should just have a different name, just be, I don't know, the movement. But but um, you know the the uh, the idea of this image, the post-carbon city, you know, comes from ideas of transportation and mobility, air quality issues, uh, energy generation from solar, wind turbines, independent battery packs, to flood uh, or sea level rising, to flood management, to farming, vertical farms, uh, a big part of it, to different uh, use of, of biotech and living materials to waste systems and refuse changing in cities to uh you know where we get water and, and and more so you know cities are all of those things waste food water energy air quality mobility equity like uh, and more uh so so a drawing that shows as much of that as possible that one could look at and say i like most of it but here's some things i would change that was the kind of the purpose and there is a riparian corridor going through the center that's supposed to be teeming with aqueous life and we're getting rid of cars you know just no reason for cars in a dense urban downtown core this is 42nd street that's the chrysler building this is a civic space for pedestrians to walk it's not for cars and we have high throughput transportation and trackless trains or basically linked articulated autonomous buses that get us from A to B and that are very much aware of where pedestrians are and don't need to move that fast. And then there's all kinds of, of living elements on the surfaces of our buildings for food or for air quality. And there's some idea of a modicum of maintenance through automation, some smart robots that can help service these things. Of course, human gardeners can do that too from double skin facades. They can occupy the interstitial space in those buildings and help grow different food, uh, plants for uh, creating better air quality or for food or psychological effects. So all of those things are in that particular drawing and they're meant to be there. And they get criticisms like, oh, there's going to be a lot of bugs and mosquitoes. Well, you know, we're in insect apocalypse. Bugs are going away. <laughs> Actually, 
can't get rid of them. Part of what you don't see in there, besides all the energy devices that are there, solar panels and wind turbines that are on the skins of buildings, are areas to save insects. So we worked on a monarch sanctuary to save butterflies because they're disappearing. Now the monarch, we've been working on this project for a long time, five years plus, the monarch is an endangered species like the bald eagle or North American wolf uh, and many other things that just disappear. These beautiful creatures, which are native to New York, are almost gone. The surfaces of these buildings in post Carmen City were meant to be refu uh, 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 sorry, sanctuaries or places of uh, 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 refuge. Yeah. Yeah, habitat and refuge for things like monarchs and other insects. And we need to, they're pollinators, not just bees, but we need to take care of all those plants. Can't be all done by robots. So what's not in that drawing are still things we are still working on at full scale. We've engineered a two-ton facade with uh, BASF, different types of, uh, of uh, construction materials that would last 300 years and a structural design for butterflies. That was our client. So it's in that drawing in the post-carbon city, which is still this idea of a, of, of, a, of a city based on a steady state economy where things are cycling, where people are fairly treated, where uh, as much as possible, we're, we're entering this civilization 2.0 that's clean, and green, and, and uh, you know, represents a radical transformation from the kind of the 20th century mentality of skyscrapers for corporations. So uh, that, that that's what's in that drawing and more. Yeah, I mean, you use the term civilization 2.0, which I think is kind of synonymous with, you know, what I use in the title of my book, the new earth. You know, what is this new earth? I mean, it has to do with how humans who are here on earth inhabiting it in a way that really makes sense for all of life, you know, to live together in the most beautiful, sacred and harmonious way. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, look, we, we got the earth. It was just fine. We had everything we needed. It was just on the ground. And uh, we know, made a big kind, mess. We're recognizing, yeah. though, you know, here in North America, the way the Native Americans, you know, inhabited the earth before it was, you know, colonized by the Western culture. But we also see... Uh, in Australia, the Aborigines, they when they discovered or you know and have took over Australia, they just thought these Aborigines were completely primitive and the landscape was just natural. But they're now starting to understand that the Aborigines interacted with the landscape in a way to make it what it is, much more habitable for them, but in a way that's so different than Western thought. And also, what we're discovering now that we're you know, uh, cutting down and burning all of the uh, Amazon rainforest is they're seeing these intricate designs and this type of soil that was there. And that actually before the Spanish came and conquered it, there were cities of millions of people there that within just a few years completely, they were decimated by the uh, uh, diseases that were brought there. And these cities disappeared underneath this very rich foliage that we're now starting to see that humans did interact with nature in a way that we as Westerners would just call it was wild. We don't see it as human interaction and development because it looks so natural that it just looks like that's nature in its own. But we're now starting to learn and the type of stuff that you're doing, you know, Patria, is to work with nature as a form of technology that's radically different than our conventional Western scientific logical way of designing and building and making things. It, and it's, it's to the point where it looks natural rather than man-made. But, you know, that's this big shift. It's a big shift of consciousness, but this consciousness already did exist in the Aboriginal peoples, you know, of Native Americans and other, you know, societies from way back when. And now, yeah, to integrate it into this kind of Western technological mindset or to take this next step, civilization 2.0, as you call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of what you said, I agree with. There's a great book by Julia Watson um, called Low Tech or Radical Indigenous Technology, where just going back to the way things were done a few thousand years ago and realizing that is a technology. It is super valid. 
it works within our uh you know natural systems and is something that we shouldn't discard it may take up a little bit more land maybe slower than mechanized versions or chemical not versions as cost effective and that's a big not as cost right, not not optimized so but... many things because is it the is it the cheapest way to do it and i think in our new earth civilization <laughs> we know we should shift is this the most beautiful the most sustainable way it might not be the cheapest or most economical but those in the long run don't make the most sense i know i know and, and there, there are arguments against that too like I'm, I'm still on the fence about some of this like a, there's a wonder bread argument which uh, i know our time is limited but that argument is you know um what would you rather have organically fair traded uh farmed bread made of 13 or 17 different types of wheat uh that's that's then sold at a supermarket and is very expensive but is very healthy and very good for the environment no fertilizers what have you uh versus something like wonder bread and wonder bread is basically a chemical uh everything that goes into it is is just highly processed it's the most processed of all foods but you have, you know, 7 billion people you need to feed. And there's just not enough farmland or organic farmers to give everyone or to meet that price point to give everyone that organic whole grain, you know, bread. And so the Wonder Bread technique, which represents a thousand years of industrial production or a couple of hundred, depending on where you want to start, like does, does feed people. And, uh, it, you know, can't just disappear overnight so I don't, so, I, so i don't agree with that yeah. and check I out think, that argument it's yeah, not yeah. mine but I it's, think, it's a real one i understand the argument i don't agree with it and i think it ha comes down to mindset and the way we think i think we can if everyone gets is thinking that way all have the most nutritious you know heirloom grain breads everywhere and do away with that industrialized wonder bread model that's the model that yeah. we're going to make a new model to make that one obsolete. We do. We <laughs> do. My, but, but my like, opinion or view. Yeah, but this this Wonder Bread has got a massive shelf life. The fresh whole grain stuff is done in a couple of days. But we're, like, unless people just are all farming, which I'd be good with, like how do we possibly feed 300 and something million Americans? Like it, like we, yes, maybe it's on a on a if we put on a blackboard a whiteboard, you know the the math on we can do it the organic way, okay. But because the people won't be having to go to do these other meaningless you know trivial jobs that are part of the system, and they'll be able to go and have their farms to grow these heirloom grains and do it out of love and do it yeah. in harmony. You know, I mean, you know. We, I agree. We are, I agree. you know, we operate. No one should have a job anymore. No one on earth should have a job. No one. A we job is an industrial. Love. Do what you love. It's a career. Career isn't even the right way. It's, it's just a function of what you want to do. And I think technology is racing towards that. There's a lot of discussion about automation and replacing truck drivers and burger flippers and all of these things with, you know, simple AI and basic robotics and, that should happen because people need to spend more time with their families and their communities. And if they want to farm and they want to cook or they want to take karate, they should just do that all day and be happier society. Uh, and so eventually we should get there. I, I, I'm, I think Andrew Yang had a bit of a promise there with this kind of like uh, the, the basic, what was it called? The basic income plan, um, yeah. universal basic income yeah. like that. That was the beginning of it. Obviously, some people have it wrong, but yeah, I don't believe anyone should have a job. Like that's just insanely cruel and horrible. Uh, you should do things because you love to do them, and you want to be a part of it. So yes, that would help us get out of the Wonder Bread mentality. Yep. Well, you know, this, <laughs> you know, I don't know how long we've been going on, but it's been a great conversation, and it's really interesting because we both have the same ultimate vision, and we come from it from kind of opposite ends of it you know you're you know much more entrenched in the real world 
you know, being, you know, this professor at NYU and running this nonprofit and, you know, you're, you're doing it in a very practical real world way. I'm coming from it from a little bit more of the visionary end of things. Uh, and yet we're both looking at the same issues and wanting to create these, you know, models that will make the, the, the yeah. this, this new earth a practicality. So, uh, you know, just in, I guess we can kind of wrap it up. Is there any last thoughts that you want? No, to no, I, 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 I think you really got a, a lot of great ideas in this conversation. Come and visit us at Terraform One again. We're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, I love the work that you're doing. I love this conversation. Uh, where's my copy of the book? I definitely want that. You have to sign it for me and I'll give you a copy of our book, Design with Life, uh, which is also out and we can trade books and, and drink some, we're making whiskey here locally. So, you know, talk about, you know, where the right, grain that's comes part from. part of the new model, not this part of civilization to mega companies. So anyway, thanks for everyone to watching this. And of course, remember to hit like and share and share, you know, let your friends know about this so we can uh, get this channel out there to everyone that, you know, uh, this is worth helping to create the new earth. And we'll see you in the next Portal to the New Earth video.